back like we never left. It's Double Move Sports. As always, I'm Steph, and I'm here with the only other man in the United States of America with a haircut. Alex, say what's up to the people. Yeah, I mean, Steph, I, technically I have a haircut, but I'm cutting my own hair, so... I don't know if we should count it or not. I don't want to turn around on the camera because there's a really good chance I missed a spot in the back. Might have a little <laughs> bit of a mullet going. So for the time being, it looks okay in the front. It looks good enough. I'll give it a five out of 10. Um, so we'll, we'll keep this rolling. And um, if, you're, if you're listening on Spotify or on Apple, then you're gonna have to check out the YouTube. Let me and Steph know which one of us currently has the better quarantine haircut. I think we would love oh, to no. know. But guys, I'm hyped. It's uh, it is May sixth. Uh, when we're at the time we we're recording this, and really what we want to get into today, we talked about the running back rookies. If you haven't seen that, go check it out. But today we want to talk about the first round wide receivers, and I'm extremely hyped for some of these names on here. I think we're gonna have some pretty hot takes baked into this one. As always, we know things will change between now and when the season starts. For us guys, we focus a lot on redraft. I know it is dynasty season and we're in a number of dynasty leagues as well, but we're gonna be talking through both lenses, primarily redraft. Now I'm looking at some of the names from 2019, Hollywood Brown, Nikhil Harry. Uh, in the second round, we had Debo Samuel, AJ Brown, Miko Hardman, even other names in the third round, Deontay Johnson, Terry McLaurin. So there's a lot of guys and a lot of fantasy value to be found with these wide receivers. Something really interesting, Alex, I know I'm taking up all the airtime here, but over the last seven years, there have been just two wide receivers who have finished, rookie wide receivers, I should say, who finished as a top 12 option. Let me guess. In that first season. Yeah, go for it. Uh, one, I'm going to say, ooh, I don't know if he got there. I'm going to say A.J. Brown got there, though. He did not. Ah. He did not. I believe he was like wide receiver 19. Uh, if you went with very, very safe options and really, really big names, Odell who Beckham. would have been closer? We're talking Odell Beckham. Yep. You got that one. And then the other one, Michael Thomas. So wow. more than likely, these guys are not going to finish as wide receiver ones, but completely realistic that for them to end up as wide receiver twos, wide receiver threes, weekly flex options, and certainly dynasty options. So like there is value to be found and it's not going to be surface level. We may need to look dive a little bit deeper there's six names here that were taken in a loaded wide receiver class on draft day Alex I'm pretty excited to hop into the first one here yeah draft day came and went and we all I think had Henry Rugg Jerry Judy and CD Lamb as the consensus top three wide receivers in this class shocking to me and I think it was shocking to a lot of others is that uh, Henry Ruggs was actually the first one off the board I actually had CeeDee Lamb as my number one wide receiver in this class. Jerry Judy was number two, but wow, John Gruden went out and got his Tyreek Hill light and Henry Ruggs. I think he is going to get usage in this Raiders offense, and no, he's not the most complete receiver in this class, but he's going to stretch the field. And, and last year in Oakland, it was underneath City with uh, Hunter Renfro and Darren <laughs> Waller. Those two guys combined for 188 targets. They're actually first and second on the team. So knowing the narrative around Derek Carr and that he only likes to check the ball down, he doesn't like to, to sling it deep, um, Gruden is giving him no excuses this season bringing in Henry Ruggs. He has 4-2-7 40 yard dash speed. I, I just don't know if I can trust him as a as a week in and week out wide receiver. Um, he, he certainly will have big plays. And if you start him the weeks where he breaks a, a 60 yard touchdown, you're going to be thrilled. But like you just said, rookie wide receivers historically aren't getting 10 targets a game. So I just don't know that the workload is going to be there consistently for Henry Ruggs. But, but I certainly think he's in wide receiver three flex territory um, in this Raiders offense. It, it is a crowded room as well. They brought in Nelson Aguilar. Tyrell Williams is going to be healthy. Waller is, to, <laughs> Waller is still there. They got Hunter Renfro. Um, they also drafted Brian Edwards and Lynn Bowden in the third round of this same draft. So it's going to be loaded there. Henry Ruggs is obviously going to be involved because of the draft capital that was spent. Um, but but I'm not freaking out going, you know, insane, grabbing him early in drafts. I think the Raiders certainly are hoping he turns out to be more of a Tyreek Hill than a Darius Hayward Bay. <laughs> I think I'm more bullish on rugs than you are, but yeah, I, I'm with you, right? Like the, the low hanging fruit, when we saw this move made and everybody came out there, we saw the headlines and all the narratives. Oh, Derek Carr's not a gunslinger. He's not gonna be able to hit this guy deep. But I think one thing that rugs will lead to him getting onto the field is his utility just as a field stretcher to open up more of that underneath uh, options. 
Yeah, folks are going to try to stack the box up against Josh Jacobs. And if they do, I mean, that's going to leave Ruggs on an island one-on-one, -on -one, which I think you take that any day of the week, regardless of his route running or how complete he is. Speed kills in the league. We all know that. Knowing that, hey, Ruggs is probably going to be on the field a decent amount. Not to mention the investment at, at the 112 spot in the draft and the fact that the Raiders need a wide receiver one. I'm very excited for Henry Ruggs in this offense. Carr had a crazy completion rate. He was at like 70%, I know, through a big chunk of the season, which was number one in the league. We don't think of Carr as that deep threat uh, type of or gunslinger type of quarterback in this death by a thousand cuts offense that Gruden runs. But over the past two seasons, Ruggs has caught 87% of the catchable passes thrown his way. Only two drops, so I love his hands. You know, we look at some comps in this Gruden Raiders offense. We got Tyrell Williams last year at 15.5 yards per reception. We, we saw them try to fill this role with Martavis Bryant back in 2018. Yikes. And we saw Amari Cooper, you know, he was at 14.2 yards per reception under Jack Del Rio before Gruden came in. So I feel like this is a void that they've been trying to fill for a minute now. And I think they finally got their guy. And another way that I think Ruggs could really get used is kind of like we saw Debo Samuel, right? The end arounds, the jet sweeps, the RPOs. There were some other names that the Raiders could have easily took there. Why not take a Jerry Judy as a pure, you know, you think of an alpha wide receiver one. They did not do that. And I think Ruggs is really, you know, Gruden saying, I want to get my guy here. The 18.7 yards per catch in his senior year of college was insane. I think it'd be crazy for us to say, hey, just copy and paste it over to the NFL. But you look at that Tyreek Hill comp, Listen to Tyree Kill's rookie season. I think this is right where Ruggs could actually be at. Of course, the quarterback play is not there, but uh, Hill was 61 for 83 uh, in terms of targets and receptions, 593 yards, six touchdowns, and 9.7 yards per reception. I think he helps the entire offense. I already talked about the Josh Jacobs uh, getting the box stacked against him and, and what that can do for Ruggs, but man, I, I'm excited. I do really like Ruggs a lot. Maybe I'm more bullish on him than most of the guys out there, uh, but I, I really do like the fit. I think it's something that the Raiders have been looking for for a long time, especially Gruden, you know, going out and getting AB and all that. Yeah, absolutely. There, there certainly is an Antonio Brown-sized hole in this offense. Steph, what was that um, yards per catch number on Tyree Kill's rookie year? He was a 9.7, which he's blown by that every year since. Wow, that seems uh, so very I think low. That, yeah, it was. It was. And after that, I believe he was somewhere around 13 to, to 15 every year wow. after. So it was something where we're going to see him grow into it, just like we mentioned at the beginning, right? These rookie wide receivers are going to slowly ease into the offense. Very rarely do we see a guy just get drafted and absolutely take over unless they're a top, top, top end talent like OBJ or Michael Thomas. Let's go ahead and move on to the next wide receiver off the board. It was Jerry Judy to the Denver Broncos at the 15th overall pick absolute steal absolute steal for denver i think they were one of the teams we all had circled to go out and get a wide receiver in this draft with the jets picking in front of them with the 49ers originally having a pick in front of them before they traded back and the raiders i don't think that the broncos saw any chance uh to get jerry judy barring them trading up themselves and they were able to sit back and get an incredibly talented wide receiver out of alabama I love the talent of Jerry Judy. I'm still 50-50 on the landing spot. I certainly think there's mm -hmm. opportunity um, opposite Cortland Sutton in this offense. I, I just don't know that there's going to be enough to go around. Last season, we really saw Drew Locke show some upside. Towards the end, he got five starts there. And if Drew Locke is going to be the guy, I certainly think Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy can both be fantasy relevant. But to me, like Sutton is going to be a lock for his 125 targets. Noah Fant is a really hot name as a breakout at the tight end position, and I see him getting close to 90 targets this year. So wow. just knowing that there's not going to be a ton of volume in this offense from a passing perspective, I mean, they just brought in Melvin Gordon to go along Philip Lindsay. So they've got weapons everywhere. Just knowing that they're not going to be throwing the ball 600 times um, this season, I, I kind of question whether Judy's going to be incredibly – fantasy relevant this year i actually do have him as a wide receiver three i think he's gonna creep close to that 100 target mark just because denver is so desperate for that wide receiver two spot to be filled alongside of Cortland sutton they actually went out and got kj hamler as well in round two which we're going to talk about um, on another podcast but i have judy right around the emmanuel sanders anthony miller jamison crowder range guys that you can put in your flex 
week mm-hmm. to week and expect maybe 15 points. Maybe you're just spot starting him during bye weeks. But that's kind of the area I have Judy in for this season. I certainly am a big fan of him in Dynasty because he's got a great young core on this offense to go around with Drew Locke, Cortland Sutton, Noah Fant. Um, so, so that's my take on Judy. I certainly I think Drew Locke was – I'm already in a prime position to break out this season, and that's going to do nothing but help him. I actually am worried that his ADP is going to fly <laughs> up now because they went out and got him so many weapons. So, you know, that's that's how I see Judy kind of working into this offense. I, I'm a little bit just ever so slightly less bullish on Noah Fant. I, I really think when it was just Sutton and Noah Fant in this offense, the, the ceiling was astronomical for Fant. This might cap that a little right. bit, but I, but I do really like him as a sleeper candidate at the tight end spot. I don't think Sutton is going to be affected at all. Steph, I know I just broke down a lot there for this Denver offense. <laughs> um, what are your takes? Do you think I'm wrong? Do you think Judy's going to be more involved than I do? Yeah, just like you, I see that some late round appeal and redraft as a flex for Judy. Really, to me, it comes down to, do you believe this Broncos offense has it? I mean, if, if Judy went to the Raiders, I think he would be far and away. Like, we might even have him at wide receiver two range just because of all that opportunity and making him really the de facto one there. Like, yeah, the landing spot, man, it's kind of gross. But Judy's the most complete and well-rounded wide receiver in this draft. Uh, I think he passed everybody's eye test, and his measurables say the same as well. He has elite speed, great route running, great hands. What could really make Judy a star to me is Pat Schumer. You know, the, the Broncos brought him in as their offensive coordinator. And Schumer loves a play action pass, and he's shown to be great at developing young quarterbacks. He was with Sam Bradford at the start of his career when he won Offensive Rookie of the Year. He coached a second year Nick Foles back with the Eagles into an absolute beast in 2013 when he threw 27 touchdowns and two interceptions. He helped Case Keenum uh, be fantastic when he took over for the for the Vikings back in 2017. So, if you believe in Schumer, and you believe in Drew Locke, you believe in the Broncos' offense. Yeah, why not take a shot on Jerry Judy? I believe he's a great player. I think we all do. And he'll definitely command some volume. Uh, I think even going into year two and three of his career, he could even pass Sutton as the one there in Denver. I know that's a hot take. And I love Sutton. uh, But just Judy is such a complete prospect. you got to love him here. Uh, Definitely worth taking a shot on the later rounds, mid rounds of your draft. Steph, is it? Schumer or Shermer? <laughs> it, it's Shermer. My bad on that one. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just say it's Schumer, though. Yeah, hey, I mean, maybe it's his his evil twin brother <laughs> um, or something like that. I don't know. But, no, I think you bring up a great point. There's a lot of turnover in the NFL with some of these coordinators and things like that that people don't realize. Maybe, actually, certainly, a guy I'm going to talk about later is Gary Kubiak with the Vikings, and he's going to be their new offensive coordinator and play caller. So a little plug there for, for later on in the pod. But, a lot of offenses can have some pretty big changes year over year just because of play caller changes, just because of coordinator changes. So knowing that that Shermer is coming into this offense, uh, given the credentials that you just laid out, I think it could be big for Drew Locke and for everybody. So I love that, and I certainly am excited for this Broncos team. They're one team that I could see you know, piecing it together and making a wild card run. Maybe they finish close to double digit wins. Maybe they get to nine and seven, but I could also see the, see the wheels coming off and then picking um, pretty early in the draft <laughs> next season. So we'll see. Yeah. It could be one of those things like, like almost like Trubisky where if things start to go South, they're like, get Drew Log out of here. Five games is just, it's not enough. It's such a rough sample size to go into this season with, uh, but let's move on here to CD lamb, who is another absolute steal, but another, not so hot landing spot. I was floored when Dallas took CD. They took him at the 117 spot uh, in the draft. When I look at the Cowboys offense, I do think Dak can sustain a third wide receiver behind Amari Cooper and, and potentially fighting for targets with Michael Gallup, who we saw had a great uh, breakout season last year. We have the Cobb targets vacated. We have the Jason Witten targets also vacated right there. That's 166. Looking at across the entire NFL, they're second. The Cowboys are in most vacated targets. And we saw Dak Prescott hitting his stride in the passing game. He was fifth in pass attempts at 596. Amari Cooper, 118 targets. Gallup, 113 targets. Combo that in with the fact that Jason Garrett's gone, and now they bring in Fat Mike, Mike McCarthy, who we (laughs) see rely on those three wide receiver sets pretty often. We saw high pass volumes with him in Green Bay. So if we assume there's going to be some similarities there and Mike hasn't gone all in on the the new school analytics like he said he did, then I think we can can bank on C.D. Lamb having some fantasy viability uh, in his first year in the NFL. 
So to me, CD's a slight downgrade to Gallup. Alex, would you agree? Yeah, I do. I I still have Cooper as a low end wide receiver one. Uh, Gallup right now is a high end wide receiver three, where I have CD Lamb as as more of a, a mid to low end wide receiver three. I'll get I'll get into my takes here in a minute, but but yeah, I think. Uh, Lamb is just slightly under Gallup in terms of value for this season. Yeah, it kind of pigeonholes Gallup into in a, almost being more of a pure deep threat. We know that was part of his game, but it almost seems like now we're going to bring C.D. Lamb in here to take on more of the underneath stuff. But just like you said, like Amari, he's still the alpha dog. He's on a huge contract. He's been the man since he got to Dallas in that trade. And while I don't comp the two skill sets, one similarity I do see between Lamb is like what Hollywood Brown was last year. Like, like you can take a shot on him early if you believe. He'll be difficult to predict based on matchup, but he'll inevitably have his games. And in year one, I'm predicting somewhere around 75 targets. And for Dynasty, I absolutely love him as a guy who can surpass Michael Gallup as the two. Um, and maybe even if Jerry Jones wants to move on from Amari Cooper's massive deal, maybe in two or three years, maybe three or four years would be better there. But you know, I can see <laughs> CD kind of, of moving into that spot and developing him. So I, I love it. And we look at his college production. He had some of the best out of all the the names taken in this first round of wide receivers. 14.3 yards per target, 4 yards per per route run, 11.1 yards after the catch, which were were number one across all the rookies in this class. So all three, uh, here's one more, Alex, before I let you get into your takes. This blew my mind a little bit. All three 2019 Cowboys wide receivers were top 31 in fantasy points during the 13 full weeks that they played together. So I think there is sustainability that Dak Prescott can have. And now with you know Witten not taking up 83 targets and falling forward for three yards, I think uh, CD is going to get some definite usage <laughs> in this Cowboys passing game. That's a great call. I, I think I'm with you for the most part. But the, my first reaction, I got to say, Jerry Jones coming out hot guns a blazing hot. sitting in the yacht on draft day just giving <laughs> us some flexes left and right saying hey look cd lamb's on the board i don't care if i don't need a wide receiver i don't care if my defense is made of like foldable chairs i'm gonna go draft <laughs> cd lamb because he's a shiny new toy i am obsessed with dak prescott and i want to make sure Dak comes back on a long-term deal so jerry we see you um and i think cowboys fans at first, I mean, Steph, we, we know a couple Cowboys fans, and, and it sounded like the sentiment at first was, you know, why? But I, I think as the season gets closer, those Cowboys fans are going to continue to be excited for CeeDee Lamb. He was my number one receiver in this draft. He was a steal at 17 overall. No, the Cowboys didn't need him, but, I mean, he's going to be fun in this offense. The biggest winner to me is Dak Prescott. Yep. I think Dak, right now he's my QB4. I do have Mahomes, Lamar, and Kyler in front of him. But I would not be surprised at all if he finishes in the top three, maybe even the top two. He finished at two last year, maybe with these weapons, maybe with Mike McCarthy. This is a year where we can see Dak take an additional step forward as a quarterback. But to your point, I I know there's the vacated targets in this offense, and that's the narrative everyone's taking with they can support three wide receivers. But to me, this will affect Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup. I do think they can sustain three receivers, but before I had Amari Cooper as a borderline top eight guy, I was super high on Gallup. I had him locked into the top 20, maybe even creeping towards a high-end wide receiver too. Like I mentioned just a minute ago, Cooper is, is down a couple spots to a low-end wide receiver one. Gallup is a high-end three for me. Um, and Lamb himself is still a wide receiver three. So I certainly think you will get value out of all three of these guys in 2020. Uh, but the big takeaway for Lamb, for me, he's my favorite rookie in redraft. And if something were to happen to Amari Cooper or Michael Gallup, I think Lamb would immediately be a top 20 wide receiver with, with even more upside than that. Um, so I'm super excited about Lamb. I think he's going to continue to get involved as the season goes along. Um, and this Cowboys offense is going to be fun. Just thinking about what happened in Tampa last year, Jameis Winston threw the ball, it seemed like a billion times because their defense couldn't stop anybody. Not only did the Cowboys retool on offense, but they let everyone on defense <laughs> go, uh, it seems like. So they could be giving up a ton of points, which in turn means they're going to have to be scoring a ton of points. So this is an offense that could be super high volume in 2020. And from a fantasy football perspective, that's the exact kind of offense that you want to invest in. Very nice. Yeah, I like that point there on the defense too. That's exactly the kind of team makeup that we're looking for as fantasy players. 
But speaking about high upside, I want to talk about a guy who is a my guy. He's one I had circled and was so Ooh. excited for him. Jalen Ragor taken at the 121 spot in this draft by the what Philly, a cool name. Philadelphia Eagles. I know, Ragor, it's just such a badass name. It sounds like something out of Game of Thrones like, or he something. He feels like he's in Game of Thrones. <laughs> to me that's right <laughs> well, look I'm, I'm trying to get my hands on this guy anywhere i can outside of rugs i think he has the highest pure upside like if we're just talking upside i put him up there as as potentially the one in his first year we have a declining alshon jeffrey and they were even talking about moving on from him in this offseason they still might he could be a cut candidate He's dealt with a lot of injuries. Same with Deshaun Jackson, uh, who was pretty much missed all of last season and, and passed his prime as a pure speedster. Carson Wentz, we just talked about the volume in, in Dallas. Well, look at the volume in Philly. Carson Wentz threw 607 passes, which is even more than Dak. So it's another one That's like lot. Ruggs where this team needs a true wide receiver one. Ray Gore is a physical go up and get it kind of guy. And I'm not kidding, guys. Literally, like, go watch this guy's college highlights on YouTube. This kid is a walking highlight reel. I'm so excited to watch him play. I think he could see as high as 90 targets in this offense. And at, at TCU, we never really saw Ray Gore with a great quarterback. And I'm very excited to see him with somebody like Carson Wentz who can sling it, who can be accurate. And it seems like the, the Eagles have been trying to find this deep threat, the void that they can fill. You know, we've seen names like, right, we just mentioned Deshaun Jackson, but even like Matt Collins and Aguilar are taking, you know, 60-yard air yard receptions <laughs> to the house. Like, Yikes. that just gets me excited for Ray Gore. I know this is a hot take here, but I love him as that deep threat role in Philly. No, I'm with you. I, I was big on, on Rager coming into the draft. I, I know a lot of people were surprised to see him go in front of the Justin Jeffersons of the world, but I love the pick for Philly. The, the biggest thing – that that we've been saying in, in redraft and dynasty leagues and it's even more true in the nfl is you got to go get your guy what happens in the media is these guys get hyped up and then one media outlet whether it's espn or whoever puts out these rankings and everyone starts to buy in and play off of that narrative the eagles love jalen rager they love what he's going to be able to do in this offense stretching the field and they went out and got the guy that they that they wanted and i can't fault them for that i certainly think rager is an incredibly talented player um, but for me, this season in redraft leagues, I just don't know that I'm going to want to trust him week in and week out. I know I wasn't super bullish on Ruggs, and I have Ruggs just slightly ahead of Rager. I think he's going to have a really solid rookie season, and, to, and he's going to develop into the clear-cut number one on this Eagles offense. But from a fantasy football perspective, I look at, at this Philadelphia offense, and let me name some names. You, you hit most of them, but this season they've got Alshon, Rager, um, Ertz, Goddard, Miles Sanders. They traded for Marquise Goodwin. Right. Um, Deshaun Jackson's still there. J.J. Arcega-Whiteside is still there. Boston Scott gets a lot of catches out of the backfield. So for me, I'm thinking someone – I mean, obviously they spent the draft capital on Rager, so they're going to give him the ball and they're going to feature him in this offense. But, like, something's got to give there. And I wouldn't be surprised to see a name or two on that list get cut before the season. Maybe that gives us a little bit more clarity – um, but, but I certainly don't think Rager finishes with 100 or more targets this season. You said he's pushing 90 potentially. Yep, potentially. I actually do think that's reasonable. I have him – I've statted him out already. I have him at 86. That certainly could fluctuate up um, once this receiver room starts to shake out a bit. So, for me, I'm really big on Wentz this season compared to last year. A lot of people are going to be sleeping on him, saying he's injury prone, and yeah, he kind of is. But um, look at what he did last year. His entire receiving group was beat up. Greg, I forgot Greg Ward on my list. He was the guy that led the way for them last season. He was using tight ends as his wide receiver one and two. So just knowing that Alshon's going to be back, if he has anything left in the tank, that's going to help. The tight ends are awesome. Rager's going to stretch the field. They went out and got a playmaker in Marquise Goodwin. And Miles Sanders is a great running back who can do it all um, in the receiving game and on the ground. So I think this is huge for Wentz. I, I certainly like Rager as a player. I, I don't know that I'm going to want to rely on him from a fantasy perspective, but this Eagles offense should be much improved next season. I can't wait to grab Ragor when, when everybody sees on him, including you in our leagues. His comp to me, like we look at player profile and just his measurables, you know, they, they put him right next to Christian Kirk, which we see him as an emerging deep threat. He's one of those names that you're taking late in a draft and taking a shot at just an upside guy. Ragor to me could be like DK Metcalf last year, right? Give him the first part of the season to get going. And I know with the coronavirus situation, there's not as much time in camp, OTAs, all that. So give give Ragor some time to get going. 
Uh, and if we see it, I, I, I mean, if we see anything at all, I think you pull the trigger, whether it's a trade, grab him off waivers, or, or take, make a move for him in yeah. Dynasty because he will be dominant, especially, I think, later in the season and will be a baller in this offense for years to come. If I'm taking those upside deep shots, for me, it's if it's not rugs, then it's Ragor. Hey, look, I... I might seem like I'm sleeping on Rager because <laughs> I've got him statted as like a low end wide receiver three, but I certainly think the upside is there. And I think if there's a guy in this class that can kind of, um, t- I mean, it was Terry McLaurin last year, right? He was a third round pick and he ended up being incredible in that, in that bad offense. Think about what Rager could do as potentially the wide receiver one in a really good offense with a lot of passing volume. So I certainly think there is a roadmap for the upside of Jalen Rager. I actually made a bet. Um, with a buddy that Jalen Rager would finish with more receiving yards this season with Justin Jefferson. He was pretty confident in the bet, too, so I would love (laughs) to see Rager come out um, and win me that bet. But speaking of Jefferson stuff, let's go ahead and jump in. Just one pick later at 22nd overall, the Vikings got their Stephon Diggs replacement and Justin Jefferson out of LSU. What do you think of this move? I love it. You know, the, the one thing that is a little bit concerning to me, though, is just the skill set doesn't really fit that Stephon Diggs mold. Uh, he does have 4-4-3 speed, but in my opinion, he's more of a slot guy, and that's what a lot of the evaluations and player profiles on him kind of say. He has fantastic hands, but he does struggle at times in pre- press coverage, especially when they're going up some of the uh, better corners in the league. When I look at this offense and the Vikings passing game, it's like inevitably the Vikings are going to need him. You know, if, if Thielen goes down, he's the guy. I don't see Tajay Sharp posing a big threat to Justin Jefferson, in my opinion. And he could quietly get the most targets of receptions all the out of all these first-round wide receivers. So I love him in a PPR. I put him right there. Like, if we're just taking shots, you know, all these guys really were taking shots later in redraft. Yeah, I put him up there with Ruggs and Ragor. I probably have him at three. Uh, if we're just looking at, at upside there. You know, his ceiling is not going to be capped like C.D. Lamb or Judy, where there's a lot of other options or, or you know, a learning new quarterback there like Drew Locke. But his ceiling is capped with how little Minnesota passes the ball. Uh, but with that said, I still think Jefferson could actually finish the highest out of all these first round wide receivers. And he may be number one in my rankings as we get closer to August. Wow. Yep. Yeah, I'm actually a lot higher on Jefferson than I expected to be. I I have him right? number two out of this out of these first round rookies, just behind C.D. Lamb. He walks into a great situation. I'm gonna try to ease some pain uh, about that Vikings pass volume situation for you, Steph. It, it actually was really interesting. So the Vikings threw the ball only 466 times this past season, which was 30th in the entire Ooh. NFL. The year before that, so 466, the year prior with Kirk Cousins in his first year in Minnesota, they threw the ball 606 times. So I know they implemented this run-heavy offense, and it really worked well for them, um, but I I certainly don't think that they're going to continue to pass the ball less than 500 times. So another thing that just kind of adds to this narrative, I kind of foreshadowed it earlier in the show, Kevin Stefanski left town for your Cleveland Brownies to be the head coach, and he was the play caller last season. So looking at this Vikings offense, they brought in Gary Kubiak to replace him as the offensive coordinator. He's expected to call the plays, and in Kubiak's last four seasons as a head coach, uh, two of those were with the Texans with Matt Schaub at quarterback, and two of those were with the Broncos with Peyton Manning at quarterback. And over those last four seasons as a head coach, his teams averaged 590 pass attempts per season. So nice. just looking at what the Vikings did as, as recent as two years ago and looking at what Kubiak's done in the past as a head coach, I, I really think the pass volume's going to go up. No, I'm not saying they're going to throw the ball 600 times, but 466 times last season is brutally low. I think ballpark for them is, is, more, is more like 525 to 550 pass attempts. And even if they're on the low side of that at 525, that's you know, 60, 70, 80 more targets in this offense. And, you know, add in the fact that Stephon Diggs is gone and Jefferson is going to slide into a nice wide receiver two role alongside Adam Thielen. And I certainly think that there's some opportunity here. So I do think the Vikings are going to throw the ball more. I love Justin Jefferson um, as a pick here for the Vikings. And I think he will have some fantasy value in 2020. Yeah, I think he's like the the safest one. If we're just looking at all these names saying who's probably the safest one for, you know, 90 targets. Yeah, yeah, I know we agreed. love Ragor. That's that's certainly a hot take on Ragor. Like I'll admit that. But for Jefferson, he's got the talent, he's got the opportunity, and I love it. And like if you get Adam Thielen, why not just grab Jefferson as a handcuff? 
He's a slot guy too, just like Thielen is. He's got great hands, just like Thielen does. So I could just see him sliding into that role really, really nicely. You know, if the Vikings want to go other other ways as kind of their outside guy uh, when they're lining up with, with two or three wide receiver sets. So last name we need to talk about in the first round wide receivers, the San Francisco 49ers actually traded up for this pick at the 125 spot. It was Brandon Ayuk out of Arizona State. And what do you think about him, Alex? I see his skill set as kind of a, a good compliment to Debo Samuel. Yeah, I certainly think it's a good pick for the 49ers. They needed a wide receiver. And this offense, we know what they want to do. They want to run the ball and run the ball some more. We saw Raheem Mostert have a ton of success last season. Shanahan and his run scheme is, is one of the best in the league. So I, I certainly think that Ayuk helps the 49ers, and they're trying to retool to make another run at a Super Bowl. We know that Emmanuel Sanders left to join the New Orleans Saints. He has 53 vacated targets um, from last season in his short time with the 49ers. So they needed someone to go alongside Debo Samuel. I I think he does compliment Samuel well. It will be a bit of a one-two punch. But just knowing that this offense is such a low-volume offense, and I don't think this is a situation like the Vikings. Um, I think this is a situation where we know they're going to continue to be a run first offense. And then when they do pass the ball, George Kittle is their number one target. And number two behind him is going to be Debo Samuel, at least to start out the season. Um, So knowing that Ayuk is coming in as the third option in a low volume passing game, I'm just not super excited about him from a redraft fantasy football perspective. I think he's a fine guy to stash in dynasty he's a talented player he was a first round pick so we know the upside could be there and maybe he ends up overtaking Debo um, in this offense eventually but uh, San Francisco last season had the second fewest pass attempts per game they threw the ball just 28 times and when you're thinking about how to break those up you know Kittle's going to get his targets you know Debo's going to continue to step into more targets as he develops in year two past there you know splitting those targets up between Ayuk and the other guys in that offense whether it be Kendrick Bourne or if Dante Pettis ends up making the team or dumping it off to the running back I just don't know that there's the volume to support Ayuk from a fantasy perspective so again I think it's good for the 49ers I don't think this you know hurts Kittle or hurts Debo based on what we thought about the Niners before we all knew they were going to draft a receiver at some point um, in this year's NFL draft so to me I'm not changing a lot it might give Jimmy G a slight bump and for me it's it's more of really just a good move for the team trying to compete and win a Super Bowl um, than it is for fantasy relevance. Yeah, another thing too with Ayuk, and something that's a little bit different than all the other names that we're talking about here is he had to undergo core muscle surgery this offseason. So he's coming in with some injury mm. uh, concerns. I think that's one of the reasons why we saw him fall. He was much higher on draft boards. I saw, you know, towards the end of the college football season and slowly moved down um, when that news broke. But yeah, you know, I'm okay with any of the other names over him. Um, you know, he's one I'm kind of in a weight pattern on, much like Debo last year, right? We saw Debo taken in the second round last season. It took him a while to kind of get uh, yep. all that usage in this offense. I'm okay with waiting and seeing for any of these Niners wide receiver others other than Debo Samuel. So I'm expecting the lowest targets, um, you know, for, for Ayuk compared to all these other names here in this first round. I think long-term, like you said, right, very nice compliment to the offense. I can see him being the two to Samuel's one, but if we're just talking wide receivers there, I mean, do you really even want the 49ers wide receiver two right now when it comes (laughs) to fantasy? I don't think you do. We've seen that revolving door there since, you know, after Debo emerged, it's like, you know, Dante Pettis, Marquise Goodwin, Pierre Garçon fighting fighting for that spot there. So I'll gladly snag Ayuk off waivers in reject if we hear good things and the snapshot looks decent. Uh, But just with what's coming out from the San Francisco beat reporters now, looks like there's one where they're going to make him compete for a big role. And they got some other trusted names, kind of more uh, uh, just stalwart or known commodities like Kendrick Bourne and Trent Taylor there too, that Ayuk's inevitably uh, going to have to compete with as kind of these role player uh, guys in their pass attack. You brought up a good point. I, I don't mind snagging Ayuk late in drafts. If you're in double digit rounds and you're looking at guys and there's some names that you know the upside isn't there, but it's like a Danny Amendola or a Cole Beasley or somebody like that. I don't mind snagging Ayuk ahead of those guys. As long as you have a player like that, that you can use to plug in for bye weeks and things like that um, as kind of like a high floor type player. I don't mind taking the gamble on Ayuk. Yeah, he could be nothing this season, but as we always see with these rookies, especially ones with first round draft capital, there's always the potential for them um, to really blow up, especially as the season goes along. So I certainly don't mind the stash if you're able to do it, um, but I certainly would not draft him to be a player you're relying on. 
So Alex, that rounds up our first round wide receiver breakdown. We're going to get into some of the other names. Of course, we're going to get into the quarterbacks, maybe not the tight ends because very rarely do rookies see fantasy relevance uh, uh, at the tight end spot. But nonetheless, I think there's some really interesting names like KJ Hamler was one that we brought up. Um, Denzel Mims is one that I'm really excited about. So I'm looking forward to continuing to break these down. But I think that's it for today. Just talking on these first round guys. I'm sure things will very, very much change as we move into the season. Alex, anything to say before we sign off here? One quick thing to add before we go. If you like this episode, be sure to check out our running back episode. We broke down all the running backs drafted in the first three rounds. So guys like Clyde Edwards, Hilaire, Jonathan Taylor, we broke down their fantasy value for the season and what we thought of each pick. It was a lot of fun. I know Steph mentioned we're going to get into quarterbacks and the second and third round wide receivers here soon. Um, So we're all super excited for the season. Um, I hope everybody is staying safe out there. And as always, feel free to hit us up on our socials. Um, We're always replying uh, to questions and other things on there. Love a good conversation on Twitter. Um, So, so yeah, guys, thanks a lot for listening. We really appreciate it. Alex, you're Um, playing it too cool. You, You can't be this humble. Guys, go check out Alex's breakdown on Adam Thielen that he just put out on our YouTube channel. Can't believe you didn't plug that, Bro. man. It was an absolutely killer video and all these these ones that you've been doing. I, I really thought we were about to have to do this takeover again because I like <laughs> did something brutally wrong. You scared me there. So. <laughs> no, man, I, I'm just hyped. And uh, like Alex said, guys, hit us up on social media. I, I, we have somebody in our DMs right now that is literally just hitting us up after every single pick. We are drafting for them. <laughs> we're drafting for some of these guys. I think this guy's his first time in a super flex dynasty league and so we're helping him out there would love uh just to you know put our two cents out there you don't have to listen to us but at least get some information from two other you know seasoned fantasy players but guys thank you all so much for watching and we'll catch you later